So let me uh, introduce uh, President uh, Joel Seligman. As most of you know uh, or uh, are aware, uh, Joel has been president of the University of Rochester since July of 2005. Uh, since uh, being at the University of Rochester, he's had a very big impact. He's engaged the university in a strategic planning process that is very important and instrumental in uh, charting our future. He's overseen many exciting events at the U of R, uh, just to name a few. The uh, dedication of the Robert uh, B. Gergen Hall of uh, Biomedical Engineering, the new University uh, Health Services Building, the James P. Wilmot uh, Cancer Center, and many other uh, campus developments. The prominence of U of R, uh, and growing prominence, uh, was recognized by Business Week in 2006 when they named the U of R as one of the nation's, uh, quote, 25 new Ivies. Now, um, uh, for this uh, purposes of this panel, uh, Pre President Seligman is much more than uh, our university uh, president. He is, uh, well, let me just mention his former uh, positions first, and I'll uh, talk about his expertise. Uh, he was dean of the uh, Washington uh, University uh, uh, School of Law before coming here, and he was a cum laude uh, graduate of the Harvard Law School. Now, uh, what brings him here is he's widely recognized as one of the world's leading experts on securities regulation. You might have seen him on the news and talking about it uh, many times in, recent, uh, in, the, in this recent crisis period. He's written over 20 books and has uh, authored, co authored or co-authored uh, more than 40 articles on legal issues related uh, to securities uh, uh, and corporations, including books that are considered uh, to be seminal and important uh, you know, base works in the field. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Joel Seligman, who will take it from here. Thank you so much for that very gracious introduction. Uh, it is a pleasure to join the Simon School and the Rochester Business Journal and this audience to discuss a truly important issue of public policy. I am going to try very hard to stick to my 10-minute uh, limit, although I must say, having talked about this topic on many other occasions at much greater length, 10 minutes on a $9 trillion meltdown in an economy is the equivalent to a haiku. But let me see if I can, I can frame it that uh, gives a good basis for what will be, I suspect, a very engaging discussion. First, we almost melted down our financial order in the fall of 2008. And by way of a brief review of how serious things were, Literally, you saw beginning with the housing bubble perceptibly beginning to, to burst in August 2007, uh, a series of, of catastrophic events. Some of the highlights include the March 2008 failure of one of the five largest investment banks in the country, Bear Stearns. Uh, literally, Bear Stearns was rescued by J.P. Morgan uh, but only because the Federal Reserve System came up with a $30 billion bank backup loan. On September 7, 2008, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were placed in legal conservatorship. Uh, the United States government initially was going to provide up to $100 billion to each to, to keep them afloat. Um, Fannie and Freddie at the time were responsible for approximately 50 percent of all residential mortgages in the United States, over $4 trillion. On a day that will live in infamy in, in financial circles, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt on September 14th, just one week later. The same evening, Bank of America moved to acquire Merrill Lynch for $50 billion. Two days after that, on September 16th, AIG came to the brink. Uh, it was rescued initially by an $85 billion loan from the United States, which acquired 80 percent of its stock. By September 18th, the Secretary of the Treasury, um, Henry Paulson, believed, quote, the market is ready to collapse. This wasn't just his view. As we'll see within a fairly rapid-fire order, uh, those 
deeply committed to the free market, including the President of the United States, including many in Congress, would come to share that view. On September 19th, the Treasury and the Fed took the lead in trying to raise $700 billion in a new appropriation uh, from Congress to address troubled assets. Um, within days, the two largest investment banks in the country, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, had converted from being investment bank holding companies to bank holding companies so that they had the possibility of potential rescue uh, by the Fed and the Treasury if Congress were to vote the money. On September 25th, a large commercial bank, Washington Mutual, failed. On September 26th, the fourth largest commercial bank, Wachovia, was on the brink of failure. On September 29th, the House voted down the initial $700 billion proposal, the Troubled Asset um, Rescue Pro Program, or TARP. The Dow Jones that day had the largest one-day decline in its history, close to 800 points. A few days later, the Senate approved TARP by an overwhelming majority, and then two days after that, October 3rd, the House subsequently approved a modified version of TARP. The crisis accelerated. October 7th, Iceland, of all places, almost went bankrupt. October 8th, another $38 billion was needed to rescue AIG. October 10th, the G7, the seventh most powerful economies in the world, met and, quote, put out an urgent and exceptional call for action but didn't specify what it meant. The Dow Jones lost 8% that day. October 13th, $25 billion was initially lent to the American Big Three automakers. October 13th, the Treasury suddenly announced a totally new approach to trying to rescue investment in commercial banks by making direct investments rather than uh, through the concept of buying troubled assets, and within days had invested $125 billion, starting with $25 billion for Citicorp, Wells Fargo, and J.P. Morgan. Within a couple of days after that, AIG's losses had further expanded so that within the period by early November, it received yet another $40 billion of support. On November 12th, the FDIC guaranteed up to $139 billion of GE capital. On November 19th, the largest commercial bank, Citicorp, was near meltdown it ultimately received a loss-sharing plan orchestrated by the federal government to guarantee up to $306 billion of identified assets. December, Bernie Madoff uh, confessed to having stolen at least $50 billion in the largest Ponzi scheme in our history. Now, given that I only have 10 minutes, I have to cut short uh, this resume, but it doesn't end in December. It continues right up at least till March 9th, 2009, where the Dow Jones reached a point of having declined 54 percent from its high of November 9th, 2007 of 14,165 to a close of 6,547. Of greater consequence conceivably, was that the debt markets were effectively closed for months. Unemployment rose to over 10 percent. There was as great a feeling of uncertainty and fear among not only those whose 401ks had been driven down by 40 or 50 percent, but those leading the largest private and governmental institutions in this country. What happened? I would like to suggest that there are many causes one can address in this uh, extraordinary debacle, but four, at least for me, stand out as of the greatest significance. First, we had a crisis that began in the housing market, um, an age in which typically banks would lend money and hold mortgages and felt an incentive to care about record keeping and collateral was replaced by an age in which a substantial percentage of mortgages, perhaps as much as 50 percent, were now written by mortgage brokers who wanted to securitize them or get them off their hands as quickly as possible. This was the age of the ninja loan, 
that is, loans made to individuals with no income, jobs, or assets. It was an age of as irresponsible practices in the mortgage industry as we'd ever seen. Who would buy securities, mortgage-backed securities under such circumstances? You had a, a series of significant investment banks who bought and resold them then fairly rapidly uh, at a time when there were extraordinarily glowing reports typically written about these securities by credit rating agencies. AAA ratings were standard for worlds of subprime mortgages and what in retrospect was extraordinarily greater risk. Second, you had a fundamental misalignment between federal and state regulation and underlying industry. Our regulatory system in finance essentially reached its current phase in the New Deal period. At that time, the economy was atomized. If you were a securities investment bank, you were only a securities investment bank. You weren't in commercial banking. And so a system of regulation that separately dealt with securities, commercial banking, insurance, made some sense and was sustainable and reasonably effective for many decades. That world is long gone. We increasingly face a world in which we have financial supermarkets, which not only are in securities, commercial banking, and insurance, but also swap instruments, commodities, and are not just located in the United States, but in many instances are global institutions as well. Regulation simply did not keep up. It was not properly structured for a brave new world. Third, there was a colossal failure of leadership at the federal level. Uh, many instances of this, but if I ever have the chance to write another history of financial regulation along the lines of a study I once did of the SEC, one of the most interesting questions I want to explore is to try to understand why there wasn't a much more fervent reaction to the obvious decline of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac or to the failure of Bear Stearns. They were treated as exceptional events. There was a reluctance to go to Congress. There was a reluctance to wave the red flag and say, this was a crisis. This is an emergency. We need a new order of things. I recently uh, read uh, Henry Paulson's book, or Hank Paulson's book, On the Brink, and I read it from cover to cover, and I have no greater illumination having read that book than before. Um, and it's not to be catty or, or cute. It's just simply um, there's a good deal more to the story than is yet known. Fourth, you had a systematic breakdown in enforcement of existing laws and fraud deterrence. Um, the SEC, an agency I have studied and written about and in some respects defended for decades, was particularly culpable here. Um, reports have been produced on its role in the Bear Stearns uh, oversight or Bernie Madoff case. Um, it was an agency where the tone at the top was not uh, pro-enforcement. There was a discouragement in some case of being effective in the enforcement realm. Uh, it was too siloed. Tough issues were not escalated, understaffed, uh, and the staff was often in awe of um, legendary figures like Bernie Madoff and so on. Now, what are the key legislative issues or public policy issues um, that are being considered by Congress and I think will we'll frame some of our conversation? In December, the House of Representatives passed H.R. 4173. I believe it's something like the Wall Street and Consumer Protection Act. It is 2,200 pages long. Um, I actually read it quickly. Um, I will give Congress credit unexpectedly tonight for using really large font. It's, it's, it's easier to read than a lot of documents I have to read. Um, but having said that, we know what the issues the House has so far focused on. There is a moving uh, process going on with the Senate. I'm going to tee up six issues that are clearly on the legislative agenda. No one should have any illusions. There are many more than this. But these strike me at least as six very important issues. 
First, systemic risk. This is the concept that consistently the Treasury, the Fed, the SEC was blindsided uh, by events, and consistently its ability to respond to events was too limited. Uh, proposals have been made, including one I offered in, in testimony to the House, to create the Federal Reserve Bank or formally recognize the Federal Reserve Bank as the quarterback, in effect, in, in crises like this and to authorize it to have greater powers to try to avoid and, and then respond to this type of situation. I will say the Federal Reserve Bank is not universally loved in this country. Uh, indeed, it's been kind of a whipping boy. And so there's tremendous debate in Congress as to what powers people are willing to accord the, the Fed and whether the Fed itself will be supervised by what is literally called a supervisory council, which would include representatives from the Treasury, the SEC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and so forth. Um, the emphasis in the House bill was on trying to prevent a crisis of this sort through reporting and rulemaking initiatives. My concern is also with having someone in place when a crisis occurs, and I don't see how a council can be as effective then. Number two, wind-down authority, as it's popularly called, um, the notion that rather than being boxed into a situation where you have two days or four days to address a Lehman Brothers or a Bear Stearns type crisis, the FDIC under the House and presumably the Senate version would have the ability to pursue an orderly bankruptcy over time. Um, big question here is market confidence. Uh, when you face the situation after Lehman Brothers failed, would you allow AIG to fail? There was tremendous hesitation. And the hesitation was very simple. It has what are called counterparties on a number of different instruments that it sells. If AIG failed, if money was frozen in an AIG bankruptcy, uh, this can then have a widening circle of implications, not only Iceland, but investors in this country and throughout the world. Is wind down authority going to be sufficient? Can it be used with all firms, or are there some firms too big to fail, as the saying goes? Number three, we have a half-regulated, half-unregulated system of finance. I've referred to banks, insurance, and securities firms, but over-the-counter derivatives, which were very pivotal as techniques for reducing the risk of holding mortgage-backed securities, hedge funds, to name the two most prominent examples, essentially were unregulated. Um, this makes very little sense. Among other things, it means that whoever is responsible for addressing systemic risk doesn't have effective information on a timely basis necessarily. Uh, it means, in effect, that there can be uh, greater risk taken by either those who hold or trade OTC derivatives or in the hedge fund industry that might be wise for the economy. Uh, presumably, in both the House and Senate version, OTC derivatives and hedge funds will be brought under the umbrella and subject to some form of regulation, but the truth is in the details here. Uh, what exceptions or carve-outs will there be? How far-reaching will the regulation go? And at the moment, uh, the answers are somewhat discouraging. Number four, credit rating agencies. Um, credit rating agencies were perhaps as unpopular a group in testimony before Congress uh, as any I have ever seen. Uh, they, in effect, were receiving huge fees in instances from those who issued securities, and the securities, in retrospect, were overpraised or overrated uh, by the credit rating agencies. No question that they will be subject to more significant forms of regulation, but at the same time, there is a fundamental challenge in regulating credit rating agencies. Uh, if you want to eliminate the conflict of having someone whose own securities are being rated, you could basically prohibit that and say the credit rating agencies have to be paid by the buyers of securities. If you do that, however, probably there would be 10 or 20 percent as many credit ratings as you have now. Are we better off ultimately with a flawed and conflicted system of credit ratings that is at least different than management itself? appraising 
itself, or are we better off going to the alternative, which would be a purer, if you will, form of credit rating agency approach? Congress is clearly tipping towards the conflicted uh, but better regulated approach. Number five, you may have seen stories today, and they've been frequently, about an effort by the Obama administration, uh, supported in the House, and, and to some degree in the Senate, to create a new consumer financial uh, products agency. Uh, this would address the fact that subprime mortgages, complicated and exotic mortgage products, in particular credit cards, are often inexplicable to retail investors, which is how investment banks and commercial banks refer to people like you and me. Um, the Consumer Financial Credit uh, Products Agency would be an approach to simplify, to focus on the investor or consumer first. Um, it's not going to happen as a separate agency. That seems reasonably clear uh, from statements made by Senator Dodd and his staff relatively recently. Question is, will it become a division of the Federal Reserve Bank? And if it does, how will the Fed effectively harmonize a consumer thrust with its basic concern, which is the safety and solvency of depository institutions or the overall macro performance of the economy? Finally, um, I have argued from time to time that one of the reasons that our regulatory agencies are so inconsistent in performance is the way they're funded. The SEC uh, receives or is responsible for typically 100 to 200 percent more in fees received by the federal government than Congress is willing to appropriate it. It is in a kind of regulatory vise, if you will. After a crisis, it is adequately funded for a while. But when the market is doing well, when we have reached those magical moments of the new economy, when we have much greater confidence than we currently do in investment bankers, uh, support for the SEC dissipates, and you get to a mismatch where those that the Commission is supposed to regulate are growing at very fast rates and the SEC is, is at most holding still or shrinking. Uh, I propose that the SEC, like the Federal Reserve Bank and the FDIC, be self-funded, which is to say that it would identify a budget and work with the industry to collect fees, as it now specifies fee areas. Um, this is a proposal which I have proposed from time to time. Uh, it may have a chance to be adopted now. Senator Schumer is leading the charge on this, uh, but it apparently is a, a, a divisive one. Uh, many in Congress do not want to give up the lever of budgetary controls with respect to the SEC, although they can't explain why they can do it with some financial regulators but not with others. Well, I hope I haven't gone too much over 10 minutes. I am very eager to hear the other speakers. And you have to appreciate um, the humility with which I approach this topic. Um, I am a mere lawyer. Um, to be on a panel with financial economists of the quality of those you're about to hear is, is absolutely a, a great pleasure. Um, but it makes me feel a little bit like the title of an Anais Nin novel um, I, I, I once saw but actually didn't read. I feel a little bit like a spy in the house of love. So we'll see how well I hold up to these tough customers. Take care.